No team has ever dominated an AFL season like Essendon in 2000. The Bombers won 21 home and away games, en route to a 60-point grand final win over Melbourne. In the process, they kicked 20-plus goals 12 times and averaged 131 points a match. The most overwhelming display of their scoring dominance coming in the qualifying final, where their 31 goals 12 was the highest ever total in an AFL-VFL final and resulted in 125-point belting of the fourth-placed Kangaroos. This was a team with serious firepower. The backline was tough, the midfield exceptionally skilled, and the forwards were utilised by Kevin Sheedy to devastating effect. Eight players kicked 20 goals that season, led by spearhead Matthew Lloyd, who won the Coleman medal with 109 goals, while Scott Lucas was more than handy with 57. It took 21 weeks for them to lose a game. On face value, you'd expect the match that finally cracked the Bombers would be celebrated. A plucky Western Bulldog side came into the Round 21 match on the edge of the top eight. But not only did the Doggies cement a finals appearance that week, but they managed to overcome the rampaging Bombers and cause one of the greatest upsets in league history. As great as the story is, however, the match itself has been overshadowed by just how the Bulldogs did it and is now considered one of the most infamous in the AFL era. The challenge to coach Terry Wallace and his team was simple. How do you stop Essendon's relentless scoring ability? The answer Wallace arrived at was straightforward enough and away from prying eyes, as the Bulldogs trained the tactic that would become known as the Super Flood at the home of their then VFL affiliate side Werribee. Flooding is the decision to push large numbers of players into your team's defence. As a tactic, it is almost as old as Australian football itself. In fact, centuries ago, Thomas Wills, who was a member of the Melbourne Football Club Committee and responsible for writing the game's first rules in 1859, was reported to have instructed some of the teams he captained to push large numbers of players back in defence when kicking against a strong wind. Throughout the 1990s, a version of the tactic would come back into fashion in Sydney, where Rodney Ede would coach the Swans to a 96 grand final appearance by instructing his players to push back a line when they lost the ball, essentially creating a nine-man defence. This tactic had the added bonus of affording Tony Lockett plenty of space to work with when the Swans counter-attacked. The Super Flood, however, was something different entirely. The age dramatically called it the greatest flood since Noah. As many as 14 dogs stood guard in the defensive arc, forming a wall the Bombers could neither get through nor over. The focus of the Bulldogs was on taking away any and all space from the Bombers' dangerous forwards by piling numbers into the defensive 50. Almost immediately, Dermot Brereton, calling the match for Channel 7, described what was happening. They're just flooding back inside 50. There'd be 15 blokes inside the defensive half for the Doggies. The Bombers were rattled early. The Bulldogs kicked the first two goals, and it took a dubious 50 metre penalty on the wing that brought Steve Alessio inside 50 to give Essendon their first. The space afforded by the flood allowed the Bombers to control the centre of the ground, but many of their attacks ended in an intercept mark. Essendon midfielder Jason Johnson later expressed his side's frustrations to the age. You got the ball in the middle of the ground and looked forward, and all you could see was a sea of Bulldogs players and no space. Dermy was rattled too. When asked what he thought Essendon should do to combat the Bulldogs' tactics, all he could manage was, they've just got to wait for them to tire. Kevin Sheedy, however, had other ideas. With the Bulldogs regularly having five players loose in defence, the Bombers decided to send their own players forward, including All-Australian full-back Dustin Fletcher, to start manning up their defensive spares. Shots of the Essendon 50 at centre bounces regularly showed a spare Bulldog or two, clumped in with seven or even eight pairs of players. Eventually, Essendon clawed their way in front during the second quarter, largely thanks to Michael Long's precision kicking and Fletcher's move to the forward line. He was able to leap over the Bulldogs' extra defenders to mark Long's perfectly weighted kicks or simply find space further up the ground, mark the ball in the centre square and send it soaring 70 metres over the heads of the Bulldogs who had flooded the defensive 50. The Bombers' fullback led his team scoring with three goals, emphasising the sheer strangeness of that night. 
As halftime approached with the Bombers in front, the question was raised, does Terry Wallace rethink what he's doing? As Brad Johnson was collected off the ball on the stroke of halftime, tensions caused by the confused and fiery match saw the team scuffle briefly before heading down the race, 45 apiece at the main break. Wallace persisted with his flooding for much of the third quarter, but Sheedy and his champion Bombers had begun to figure it out. Their midfielders collecting the ball in space and drawing defenders to them before releasing handballs over the top. Where Essendon had not taken a single mark inside 50 in the first quarter, they recorded 10 in the third, and as Justin Blumfield gold at the start of the last, the Bombers went 21 points ahead and seemed poised to extend their perfect season to 21-0. It was at that point the Bulldogs flicked the switch. The numbers in defence were reduced, and perhaps most notably, a young Nathan Brown, who'd been arguably the dog's best, and Chris Grant, who sat loose in the back 50 for most of the game, was sent forward. Grant kicked two final quarter goals, including a left foot snap from the boundary line to put the Bulldogs back in front in the closing minutes, after which the flood resurged, and the Bulldogs started the final centre bounce of the match with a two-man forward line. The Dogs kicked five goals to one in the last quarter to run away with an 11-point win, although Rowan Smith booted the final goal after the siren as Essendon players were already walking off. The scoreboard read 12-9-81 to 14-8-92. The super flood had extinguished Essendon's perfect season. Critics have since questioned how successful the actual super flood was. Essendon captain James Hurd was out injured, Damian Hardwick was carried off in the opening minutes and didn't return, and it took a miracle goal and multiple late Essendon mistakes for the Bulldogs to snatch the win. Yet, the answer to the question of whether Wallace's tactics had been effective is clear to see. Despite dominating inside 50s, 68 to 41, the Bombers' score of 81 was their lowest of the season, and a massive 50 points lower than their season average. The flood itself might not have won the game in the last quarter, but it kept the Bulldogs in the contest long enough for them to steal it late. Wallace and his contemporaries continue to draw criticism for this defensive focus. Football fans during the 80s and 90s had become accustomed to high scoring, spectacular matches, dominated by key forwards like Lockett, Dunstall and Ablett Senior. This style peaked in the offensive power of the 2000 Essendon team. For that night at Colonial Stadium, the 45,000 fans in attendance were treated to a taste of what football was to become over the next two decades. Tactically, this is at a new level tonight, Raritan remarked, marvelling, there's 32 players inside 50 there, or 16 players inside defensive 50, I've never seen anything like it. It was a match played 20 years before its time a superior team seeking to pick apart an opponent's highly defensive setup, using pinpoint kicking and hard running. Today, the modern football fan doesn't bat an eyelid at seeing all 36 players within a kick of the ball. Kerry Wallace didn't start this defensive movement, but his success in Melbourne's Docklands that night was noted by footy tacticians Australia-wide. Its legacy now clear for all to see in today's defensive mindsets. Teenage Robert Murphy played just his third game that night, and his recollection for the Freedom in a Cage podcast captures the legacy of this one game of Australian rules football. I was a young, naive kid, just turned 18, and Terry Wallace pulls out the super flood in the team meeting, and even then I knew, this will be radical.